Okay. So just as a preamble, I'll just give you an introduction to some ideas in photography and architecture, and then we'll move on and talk about some just interesting projects that were in uh, that we photographed and how we how we kind of um, came up with the ideas for the, the different projects. So um, William Fox Talbot's photograph of Laycock Abbey in 1839 is held up as the primary evidence of the unshakable link between architecture and photography. Indeed, in the formative years of photography's emergence, architecture was a consistent, immutable subject of choice. The early photographic practice demanded time and money, so the majority of views were uh, conducted by aristocratic amateurs. This accounts for the predominance of the country house views, as the camera and photo album supplanted the paint box and the sketchbook. For architects, truth and photography were seen as interlinked and inevitable. Sir John Robinson, an architect and a friend of William Fox Talbot, praised photography, concluding that it offered accurate views of architecture. Indeed, uh, Emmanuel volle le duc agreed that photography offered indisputable reports, and Building News in England stated that the truth of representation, like Caesar's wife, can never be suspected. At that time, photography offered a way to record and survey. In France, uh, photography was used to record architecture on large scales. Uh, this was because it was unencumbered by patent disputes that marred the uptake elsewhere. Some notable projects, such as the Mission Heliographique in 1851, the first instance of state patronage of photography, was aimed to make photography, uh, was made to, aimed to make a photographic inventory of the architectural heritage as a prelude to accurate repair. This project had emerged from earlier large-scale archival projects. Voile le Duc also contributed to those, and they were meant to be carried out with lithography. For photography's development coincides with a more scientific attitude to architectural study, with an emphasis on pictorial truth em emphasized by architects, again, Voile le Duc. However, the idea of neutral scientific survey of France's heritage was not ma manifest in the mission. One of the photographers, Gustave Le Gray, admitted, by varying focus and exposure times, the artist can emphasize or sacrifice parts that he wants, and depending on how he feels, go from the extremes of powerful shadow and light to the effects of softness and solidity in the same sight and subject. Although there is a promise of neutral observation, even at this early stage, it's evident that photography was not neutral. Photographers such as the, uh, they're called the Besson Frères, the Besson brothers, exemplify a less picturesque approach. Uh, so that's Gustave Le Gray, that's Carcassonne, and this is the Besson Frères. The Bisson brothers undermined the picturesque, and they were in tune with the French modes of architectural representation, providing large-scaled, detailed representations of Gothic details and described as clear, rigorous, sharp. This class of French photography was used to disseminate information. So what I'd like to point out that, like at a very early stage in photography, we get this kind of split where you have scientific truth on one side and then you have the artistic and picturesque on the other side. And it's something that persists through photography's history. And it's quite an interesting thing that at both times in any photograph, both ideas can exist. Okay. So this is a very famous photograph that would show the power of the image to create uh, an architecture. This is Mies van der Rohe's Friedrich and Strassen. And Mies is the master of taking a program and converting it into an image. And if you look at that image, there are so many, that's the persistent image of the modern office block. That's created over 100 years old, so that's 1920s. And yet we still have that persistent image of the office block. So photography and architecture are intertwined, both in the creation of architecture in the examples of Mies van der Rohe and the recording of it and 
the understanding of it. Okay. So just to talk about the the uh, the project itself. So the photographic approach was that it would be a neutral survey documenting the present condition. So things weren't moved around. Um, it documented things like the services, the materials, the principal spaces, the construction details. Uh, one thing that we were able to do a lot of times with the case studies was to photograph interiors, which usually proves very difficult. Another thing that we were able to do was focus, focus on the campus and the environment. So a lot of times when you see photographs of buildings, even uh, published in, in magazines or on websites, they exclude the context and the environment. That may have been something that was designed, and I'll show you some examples later on. Um, access was generally given. The building owners in general were extremely helpful, and you know that could be a resident or uh, a caretaker, maintenance people. They usually knew the history of the buildings. Okay. So then, at the beginning of the survey, this was 2011, what we did was we set up a database of... Uh, based on the Docomomo fiche and used that to input information and each uh, record was given a record number because quite often names would change, you know, something like gallery number one is Castle Street or the IFC is known as the IFI. So things like that, that was, um, we started out with 200 outline surveys of which there was 20 case studies and that expanded to 329 and there's about 2,000 photographs overall. Uh, that's, that's reduced from, that was edited down uh, from, maybe if you were doing a case study, it might be 50 to 100, and that would be reduced down to maybe 15 to 20 representative images. So the way the database was designed was that the outline surveys could be expanded into a full survey at any time. So I just picked these projects because I could, I think they're interesting and quite representative of what went on in the project as opposed to what you'll see in the books, okay? And the idea with, with choosing the projects was that they were representative of landscapes, buildings in Dublin, modern landscapes and modern buildings in Dublin. So there was a clear effort not to make it a best of, you know, the top 20 modern buildings in Dublin. So, which gives you Oblates. So if you don't know Oblates, it's on the Tyrconnell Road. And I'll just uh, refer to my notes here. Uh, so the Grotto and Marion Shrine closely modeled on the Grotto in Lourdes. It is somewhat secluded on the Tyrconnell Road. It is masked by an external boundary uh, but once you walk in, there's this amazing grotto. The grotto is interesting as a devotional re religious landscape and also as a community-created project. So it was built by local people under the guidance of some priests, and this is what they created. And it's a really interesting structure. And if we look at these pictures, I mean, they are amazing, really, really fantastic works of art in a way. Um, so then I taught from Condra Library. This is quite um, an interesting building in its own right. But what I think is interesting about this was that it was developed um, by Robert Lowry, 1937. And it's one of a multiple of libraries that are situated around Dublin. Rings End has one, from Condra has one. And it was designed so that it could be placed anywhere, regardless of orientation. So this is why you get these fantastic corner windows. And it's a really, and also what's interesting is it's using quite um, unostentatious material. It's just render and brick. And yet it's creating like a really fantastic interior. It's very well maintained. Um, it's really used by the community. This particular one in Drumcondra, it's in a really great location beside Griffith Park. What's interesting about this as well, and they were very helpful, is that the furniture is built in, so you can see the cupboards uh, opening up, uh, and that 
that conceals the services. All the radiators are built into the joinery. So, um, Clontarf Promenade. These public amenities are wonderful examples of Herbert Sims, simple, elegant, and economic designs. The bull wall shelters stand as a testament to the robust public designs and are a gift to the city. The housing and sitting architects department was responsible for the design at Clontarf. They reached completion in uh, 1958. The inclusion in, in the infantry marks these structures as an important part of the fabric of the city. Again, we try to avoid, you know, the, your 20 best modern buildings. Uh, just as a set of little pavilions, they're really interesting. I think that's one of the things that the inventory does as well, the 20th Century Survey, is it compiles all these things together so that you can look at them as a set of objects. This is one of my favorite buildings. This is Mark Mount Carmel on King's Inn Street. And this is 1941, William Byrne. It's extremely sophisticated. So this is the corridor here that we see. It's lit from either side with, with glazing, so it's getting borrowed light from the classrooms. The classrooms are really well designed. Uh, it's got playgrounds on the roof because of the constrained um, site. The brickwork is absolutely amazing. It uses these uh, um, burnt, fired bricks, and they're in a, a chevron, a cross pattern. And the, all the services are in trenches in the floor. You can see that picture on the lower right-hand corner where you have the little brass caps that you can lift up the trenches. Uh, so 1940s, like really building in a really sophisticated way, and I nearly forgot the main point. Uh, that corridor is actually ventilated uh, from a plenum and you can see the, the, the ventilation grills in the classroom on the lower right-hand corner. So it's using cross-ventilation to ventilate the corridor. So it's really like, you know, these buildings are quite sophisticated for their time. Um, so then, moving on to more sophistication, College of Domestic Economy, this is Robertson and Keefe. Um, another example of where you've got the services this is quite an interesting building as well. It's using reinforced concrete. And then you've got this grand staircase. And as you can see in the lower right-hand corner, you've got the ventilation system. But what's interesting is it's this crossover between early modernism and almost like classical mannerism. If you look at the lower left-hand corner, you can see the back elevation of the stair, that grand stair. And what you'll notice is that there is a gap and that's where the ventilation goes up. You can see a recess in the windows where the, re the windows are level with the stairs on the inside, but are recessed on the outside so this ventilation can go up. So it's a really, it's a quite sophisticated way where the, the ex external walls come in and come out. And French Mullen House, this is an, an early example of Michael Scott's influence by Gropius. Uh, what's interesting here is in the photographs, this is demolished, but it records all of the coal shoots. And then uh, the uh, gastro urinary uh, building on Mead Street. And what's interesting about that again is the services and the terrazzo uh, that was introduced by Devan. Uh, we were very lucky on the day we were allowed up onto the, uh, the terraces which were to be used for, um, you know, getting air and things like that. So again, just to emphasize, you know, the building owners and the, the, the building maintenance people a lot of the time were always, were very helpful in this regard, you know, to give us access to the buildings. Again, this is, this is a, another uh, Andy Devan building. Uh, one of the things about this is that the uh, campus is fully intact. Amazing detailing in, that, in the church. Uh, it's a really fantastic campus. Uh, you go around the, uh, the church and there's a promenade down. And then I'll just move on. So this is 
uh, board foliage. And I suppose when you look at these images, you really see the use of the, the survey. So board foliage was demolished, but we still have a record of some of the, the details. Even though it was built for a very low budget, you, in the images you can see the Georgian terrace that Robin Walker refers to. You can see that they put in little skirtings, metal skirtings at the base where, where plugs are plugged in. So quite an unusual detail for the 60s. Um, and then moving on to Foss, just some more images there. I think this is a really excellent project. It's almost like a landscape project up in Finglas. <clears throat> the interior, which is brilliant. And then another project that I think shows the benefit of the survey. So this is um, Herbert Muse by de Block and Meyer. And these gardens around the buildings, they're actually communal. And so by recording these, we can record them in their current state. Um, we were very lucky, we got full access into, into the, the Muse. And this is a building that many people wouldn't really know that well, but it's kind of emblematic of Irish architecture in the, the 80s. You know, you've got your quite modest materials, but really well designed, really quite exciting spaces for, for what they are. You know, they're like building in a totally different way on a really confined site. Okay, so I just th thought I'd show this because this is gone as well, but it's the IDA buildings um, and they were removed, but again, people may not have known about those. And so just to finish up, uh, the project was very wide in its scope, covering many buildings. Uh, it allows comparative analysis and also chronological analysis. It records failures and successes, records the context and environment. And it works very much in tandem with research. The way we did it was we went in in pairs into the buildings. Okay, and thanks very much for that. Thank you.